this is Kermit the Frog. Fascinating. I'm Captain Kirk. Magic is always there. I saw Long it. as we keep looking for it. Hang it. What does God need with a starship? Thank you, thank you, love you. Mwah. I protest. I am not a merry man. Voices, please. And here we go. Down at Fraggle Rock. Welcome, Bullions, Gorgs, Trash Heaps, and Things, to episode 127 of the Muppet Trek Podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Jarman, and we're on a journey across the stars to compare and contrast the creative worlds of Jim Henson and Gene Roddenberry. And what started as reviews of The Muppet Show in Star Trek, the original series, has expanded into outer space. And this week we have Fraggle Rock episode, the 30-minute work week, and next generation episode, Conspiracy. But before we do that, Steve... I want to rock. Yeah. Rock. <laughs> all right. This is that rocks. There are all kinds of gems, jewels, and geodes in the world, many of which can probably be found in Fraggle Rock. And I'm here to tell you about one of them. This week's gem is amber. So amber isn't like entirely a gem. It's really a hardened tree sap solidified in the ground over millions of years. There is evidence of it being carved by humans as far back as 10,000 years ago. Mm, so crazy old often pieces of plants animals and bugs can be found in its samples which is where we got the iconic amber from uh, Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park yeah and in ancient China it was burned and then added to acid which created a super musky perfume that everyone loved <laughs> and it was really popular until they replaced it with a byproduct from sperm whales called amber gris uh, and it's because it got used in the place of this in perfumes. Ah, uh, so it's like replacement. That's where Gris. Amber Gris Am- got its name amber. because amber was mixed with acid, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's amber, and that rocks. <laughs> I wanna rock. It's funny because I just saw a clip recently of uh, I think it was what's his name? Uh, oh, Jude Law. He's preparing to be playing a king in some movie. And they are, mm-hmm. it was a footage of him meeting with the uh, the smell person who's an expert in perfumes, perfumerist, I guess. Mm-hmm. And she was, she was historically giving him historically accurate perfumes and, and colognes that kings and queens would wear back in those days. And mm-hmm. they smelled terrible to us today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just off. And they purposely wanted to smell that way because it covered up how bad they smelled. <laughs> so Right. Like everyone smelled awful. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. So and Amber if anything, I would say that they were probably the best bathed people. If anything, I would say it was so that they couldn't smell their servants. That might be true as well. <laughs> I think it might be the more accurate thing. Because <laughs> their servants were bathing them. They didn't want to smell their servants. We're right. They only got that once a month bath, you know, and it was all together. <laughs> all so. together. Yeah. <laughs> One bar of soap. So what about Fraggle Rock here? <laughs> oh, man. Well, this week, let's check in and see what's up, Doc. Uh, Doc brings Sprocket some donuts, but Sprocket can't pick between the custard and the jelly. He weighs out his options just as Sprocket finally picks the jelly while it's lunchtime. And now Sprocket has to choose between two soups. No. Doc hears sirens in the distance and pushes Sprocket to finally make a decision before bedtime. He is left undecided and starving. Well, what's going down in Fraggle Rock? Gobo goes to retrieve Uncle Traveling Matt's postcard and run. Red seemingly comes with him. Gobo declares that his job for the day is done. They talk about how Wembley and his indecisiveness is getting in the way of him choosing a job. Back at the rock, Boober is doing his laundry and Wembley is deeply upset by this. He can't decide what he wants to do, but every Fraggle needs a job. He needs to put in his 30 minute work week just like everyone else. Oh, would that be nice? We get treated to a Fraggle Tune work in where they each describe sort of this, this super serious jobs they have that aren't really super serious at all, like splashing and roaming around and get in doing the wash, just generally doing very little. Moki takes Wembley to try her job gathering radishes, but it is from the Gorg's garden. Junior Gorg is there patrolling. He halts his parents, asking them for a password, which turns out is I don't know the password. And it turns into a great Abbott and Costello esque bit. (laughs) Junior gets confused and lets them by anyway. Moki and Wembley nearly get caught, but Moki just boops Junior Gorg in the nose with a radish and they walk away. (laughs) Elsewhere, Goburo offers to read Red Uncle Traveling Matt's postcard, which we will talk about later. 
Gobo decides it's time to get tough with Wembley about getting a job. Boober tries to talk Wembley into doing the laundry because it's just awful. Gobo gets tough and tells Wembley to pack his thing or he can get out if he can't decide on a job. Uh, when Wembley goes to see the trash heap and after some discussion, Marjorie says he should be a fireman because she always wanted to be a fireman. <laughs> And some jobs are even fun, is the, is the lesson we learned. Wembley goes back to Fraggle Rock, reinvigorated. Uh, I loved Wembley's line, I can't be a fireman. I don't even know how to start a fire. <laughs> we then find ourselves at a meeting of the Fraggle Rock Volunteer Fire Department. They call roll. And I love the, the guy goes, you guys all here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're all here. Uh, we get treated to the fireman's anthem. Wembley further doubts himself. Boober is not helping, uh, saying that he's going to get so scared that he's going to blow up. Wembley is asked the three firemen's questions. Do you like to wear hats and climb ladders? Yes, I do. What are your, what are your feelings about bells and sirens? I like bells and sirens almost as much as the hats and ladders. <laughs> and the toughest, <laughs> how do you start a fire? I don't know. Wembley admits he doesn't know, and it turns out that no one else does either, so it's not a big deal. Uh, they reprise the fireman's anthem, and Wembley is inducted, and it turns out he's going to be the siren. Wembley wails as the others sing, and that's what go what's going down in Fraggle Rock. Damn right. So what do you think of this week's episode, the 30 minute work week? I thought it was super cute, um, mostly because Wembley is very adorable. <laughs> but uh, I also love that they get a 30 minute work week. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but all their jobs are silly and fake. But except for Boobers, Boobers doing actual work. <laughs> He's the one washing and everyone's that's sort of, laundry. That's what I love. That, that joke about Boober is like the thing he chose to do is actually awful. <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, oh, I swim in the water, you know, to make it clean. I splash and clean the water. <laughs> yeah. But Boober's like actually slaving away. Um, yeah. I think the saddest. No he's most, such a miserable cuss. <laughs> yeah. The saddest and most adorable moment, though, is Gobo kicking Wembley out for not picking a job. And Wembley says, I'll just get my things. And Gobo says, that shouldn't be hard. The only thing you have is an extra shirt. And he's like, I'll get my thing. I'll just get my thing. It's like the jerk that movie. Where he's like, I'll just take my thermos. <laughs> and I'll just get the All I need is this thermos <laughs> and this ashtray. <laughs> and this chair. Um, and my dog. Oh, I don't need my dog. <laughs> I did notice, though, a big change in this episode that I think is what was so jarring for the first episode mm -hmm. was the boobs on the trash heap are gone. Um, so they must have been on the pilot episode and some executive has been like, we can't have those giant knockers. on." So th this was the first episode recorded oh. in production, but but beginnings was the first one aired. This was also what was used as the pitch pilot. So maybe they add the boobs later executives. and they'll be there the rest of the time. Maybe because the boobs were um, not that were very noticeably not there this episode. So we're, we're going to see. We'll see when they come in. <laughs> when the, the trash boobs. We'll make come a back. note. We'll make a note. We'll ask Boober to ask about the boobs. Oh, uh, Boober. <laughs> I did laugh out loud when Boober says to Wembley about him not getting to not going to answer the questions from the firefighters. He says, when you aren't able to answer the questions, you're going to get so anxious and terrified. You're just going to die. It's like, you're Jesus, gonna, you're going to explode. <laughs> like, whoa. And then later on, when he goes in front, Boober goes, cover your ears. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's just terrible. <laughs> just um, the most unsupported friend. He really is. But also him being the siren was hilarious. And then Doc hearing that siren outside was pretty nice. But yeah, that was cute. Yeah. I mean, this is a really fun episode. What do you think? Um, this is another one of my favorites. Uh, I think the two musical numbers they put in here, Working and the Fireman's Anthem, are great. Like oh, yeah. Top yeah. of the heap musical numbers. The, you get some sweet doozer action in Working. <laughs> working, 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 working. So good. Um, and then getting, like, it was a great arc. The only complaint I have is from a storyline versus travel perspective. It is strange that he went back to the Gorg's Garden twice. Mm. Uh, he didn't have to do that two you times. Know, normally, yeah. you wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't do the same thing twice. There'd be a second destination or otherwise. If anything, Moki's job should have been somewhere else doing something else. Or they combined. Or he should have scenes. gone with a different Fraggle. Like, yeah, yeah. Or they combined those scenes. Right. That makes sense. Um, 
so that that from a structure point of view, that's really my only issue now. But it's nothing I I noticed or cared about when I was a kid, you know. Yeah, and I I don't think it was my favorite episode so far, but there was nothing wrong with this episode. Besides, yeah, you know, that's total fair criticism. But like, yeah, that, like, like if I was an executive seeing this episode, which is what happened, then I'd be like, yeah. yes, get like, this on the absolutely, air. yeah. And that I did like the firefighter anthem too. That was adorable. So oh yeah, all, all around good episode. Uh, but what were those silly creatures up to? Well, this week, Uncle Traveling Matt thinks that he is hopping on some superb rapid transit, and it turns out he's getting on a roller coaster. So this week, we're going to be talking about roller coasters. Well, they reinforce they they uh, originated in Russia, where they started out as reinforced sledding and toboggan hills. Hmm. So the first one that like this was recorded in what is now St. Petersburg in the 17th century, and they mountained up a giant mound of snow and ice that was between seven and eight stories high, and they reinforced it with logs and built pathways into it, and it lasted as long as the cold weather lasted. This led to a more permanent structure being built in the mid-1700s called the Riding Mountain. Uh, this was a year-round structure. It was built of stone and mortar. Uh, and with pathways in it and in the winter, they would pour water down it and it would freeze and turn into like a toboggan thing. Sounds terrifying. In the summer, <laughs> they had little carts that they would put people on and they ran on this like groove on the side of the things. Ooh. And so it was a summer or winter attraction. Um, bringing us to like current times, uh, there are more than 2,400 roller coasters operating worldwide. Uh-huh. The tallest is the King Da Ka at Six Flags in Jackson, New Jersey. You shoot 46 stories straight up and then they go eh, and you come down 46 stories the other way. Yikes. The fastest roller coaster, however, is the Formula Rasa at Ferrari World in Abu Dhabi, where you can experience speeds of a hundred and forty nine miles per hour. I was about to say, I thought it, the we said the, the tallest one was in Jersey. I was like, I'm surprised it's not Abu Dhabi or the United Arab Emirates. And like, there you go. Abu Dhabi. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Yep. The fastest one there by a huge margin. That's funny. German, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? So there's a lot of good moments, but I really was surprised and trying to figure out how they did the roller coaster scene with Travel and Matt. And I'm mm-hmm. and then I finally figured it out, I think, is that the puppeteer was the guy sitting next to him and that arm over him it's was a fake goals. arm. So I think it was a fake arm to his right going over him. And then, yeah, then he must have had his hand to sit in there. And then they had they had to ride at least two times then because mm-hmm. they had to ride for the over the shoulder shots where someone was in the cart directly behind yes. them with the camera. And they had to ride at least one other time when it was being filmed. So the minimum, Dave Goals did that two times, probably more realistic. He had a big smile on his face. He was enjoying that. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> that was funny. But that was impressive uh, to me. I was like, they pulled that off. That was pretty impressive. Um, I really dug uh, the Fireman's Hall anthem. There was just so much action, so many rapid fire bits, people coming with buckets on their heads, carrying ladders, people sliding down a pole, people being thrown in the background. The one thing that blows me away about this all the time, and I, I need to look at how they do it. There's so many of these big fraggle numbers where there are fraggles way in the back, mm-hmm. way in the back. And their mouth is moving to the right thing, just like everyone else, even though a lot of them are like hanging from walls and stuff where they don't have to do much else. I think I'm it's like, yeah, like, like, how are they filling these scenes? They must be like just one person pulling a string to like move their mouth because like they're from far yeah. away. So they don't have to move the whole body um, or anything. But it's just one of those things where they, they take these scenes and make them feel so full and have so much depth. And it was one of the best examples of that. Yeah, more so than so The Muppet far. Show. Like, there's just so much depth to what's going on. Yeah. Because you're on a stage the whole time, like Muppet Show. So it's it's an actual place. So, Jarman, what happened on this week's episode of Star Trek The Next Generation? So, Picard gets a super secret communique from Captain Walker Keel of the USS Horatio. Apparently, he's a guy he used to be super close to in his younger days. And he tells him to meet him at some obscure planet to tell no one else about it and trust no one. And once we're there, there are two other illustrious captains uh, who are with him. And Keel asks Picard personal questions to make sure that it's really him. Picard passes his test and Keel tells him that a horrible conspiracy is afoot with Starfleet. Weird orders are being given and officers aren't acting like themselves. and People are mysteriously vanishing and or dying left and right. So Picard promises he'll be on the lookout and, and 
takes the Enterprise back on course to where it was going. But along their way, they find the USS Horatio and Keel with it have been destroyed, just like in their path. So something's obviously up. Meanwhile, he had data processing through all the orders that have been given by, by Starfleet over the last several months. And data concurs that something weird is going on and that there definitely is a conspiracy somehow. So the Enterprise goes straight to Starfleet headquarters on Earth to confront the top brass. Just like going to walk, bust down the doors and figure out what's going on. And once they get there, they're greeted on the view screen in a very weird manner by these three admirals that are in charge of Starfleet. But then Admiral Quinn is also there, who we remember from the previous episode, originally talking about this conspiracy kind of starting up. And he's like, uh, Picard, uh, yeah, you have dinner with them, but I'll meet you on the Enterprise beforehand. And Picard's like, okay, good. He's still with us. He's going to warn me about what's going on. And so Quinn comes on the Enterprise, but he's acting weird. So Picard tells Riker to keep an eye on him because he doesn't think that's really Quinn anymore. So Picard heads off to meet with the other admirals on Earth to have some dinner. Meanwhile, Quinn is being real weird, and he brought a little bug monster on board, a little briefcase to infect Riker with. So he and Riker fight, and Riker gets his ass kicked, and then Geordi and Worf show up, and he kicks both their asses, too. This old man is beating the ass. And then Dr. Crusher gets there and takes him down with a phaser, finally. But meanwhile, Picard back on Earth is having dinner with the two remaining admirals, on, um, and they're acting really sketchy. But Crusher calls him right before the dinner to tell him about Quinn and that they are infected by this weird bug creature and that he'll be able to tell who's infected by the little tail sticking out the back of their neck. So he goes in the dinner pretending he doesn't know anything yet. But when they open the dishes to eat dinner, they're filled with crawling worms. Gross. But before he can run away, Riker comes to the door and stops him. Oh, no, Riker's infected, too. And then they all sit around the table monologuing about their evil plans. Until, psych, Riker was pretending to be infected, and he phasers some dudes, and then he and Picard pick them all off one by one. Then they follow one of the infecting bug creatures as it wriggles out of some guy's head into another room, and they find that Remick, that weirdo inspector from the other episode, has been infected with, like, the mother of all these creatures. So they're all inside his body, and he's, like, eating more of the creatures. And he's like, I come in peace. We just want to live peacefully. And then they're like, hell no, and they blow him, blow him to bits, and just gore goes everywhere, and he blows up, and they kill the monster inside of him. And luckily, that frees up the worm that kills the worm that was inside the head of the other admiral on board, Admiral Quinn. Or is it the end? Because apparently they sent out a homing beacon from Earth before Remick died. So more of those creatures could be on the way. And that is conspiracy. Steven, what do you think? <laughs> All right. So some things I liked. Uh, it was great to see a callback to some to a previous episode and a point towards some sort of overhead plot in the same episode. Right. It didn't go anywhere, <laughs> but it was a great <laughs> teaser of what could be in this show, which was larger overarching plot points with individual story based, like character based stories. In between. doesn't happen a lot in next generation. Unfortunately, I know it happens more in like Voyager, Deep Space Nine Definitely. timeline. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, TV was changing then. This was still the, it was right in the middle of it. The yeah. week to week episode based television. That's just what people expected. Um, I like that Code Forty Seven. We got a taste of something new that was for Captain's eyes only. Mm -hmm. This had a very different tone than any other Star Trek episode, and I thought it was a really nice departure and was another another example of them showing what Star Trek could be and could branch out into. It becomes in the future. Um, yeah. Good, slow introduction of what is happening, the mystery of the planet, the mystery of the guy, them telling him of an additional mystery. Like there's just it's over and over and it's in a good way. Um, I like that they didn't commit too early. There was a good up to a good point in the episode where I legitimately was wondering if the review was going to be it was something wrong with Picard. Oh, OK. Rather than everyone else. Like he's the one with the parasite. And so he's getting paranoid and seeing, you know, that'd be interesting. Right. But it, they, they didn't commit too early to it being this like bug parasite thing. And I appreciated that because your problem a lot uh, of episodes is that they always kind of telegraph what's going on way too early. That happens quite a bit. These episodes, um, good wharf moment in the fight and his interaction with the guy. And um, I feel like we didn't get any good wharf. And in the last three episodes, I feel like we've gotten the two best wharf scenes in the whole season so far. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I love the, the Riker, Riker double cross reveal where he's not really infected. That was good. Um, <laughs> so dislikes, we never really got a full idea of how these things spread. 
they kind of looked like the earworms from SETI Alpha 5 or SETI Alpha 6 where Kong gets stranded. Yeah. Kind of, but even that, not really. Um, then what I did, there, once again, this becomes a consistency thing. And this is my issue with a lot of the Star Trek we watch. <laughs> so for some of these guys, they had just had to blast them like one time and this thing pops out of their head. But some of them, the one guy, they had to, Beverly had to blast him like seven times. Oh, she did have a and line the thing about that. Still, and the thing still didn't come out of her head. So he, she said that she, she, which he tells uh, Picard, make sure you use, uh, put it on, on kill because they, they don't, aren't even affected much by stun. So she was shooting him with stun over and over again. That's why it took him forever uh, to fall down. Okay. But I was just and like, that's why man, he didn't all die those other guys thing, just popped right the hell out. That's why he didn't die and the thing didn't come out of his head because she was shooting him with stun and they were shooting the other I guys. I missed kill. that line. That makes more sense. Yeah. It was a quick um, line though. Some other dislikes. The. It's not that it was bad. With the guy's head blowing up, his chest exploding, and that puppet were just all very strange departures and did not feel like Star Trek. Yeah. I don't think they were necessarily bad effects. The puppet was not a great effect, certainly. (laughs) But... I just felt like it is it it needed to exist in like an Outer Limits episode or something, not in a Star Trek episode. So there Um, is a reason behind that. I don't even think I mentioned the trivia, but Apparently, Gene Roddenberry was really pissed because he kept getting a lot of pushback about this episode or other episodes recently from the top brass at the studio. And so it's kind of an F you. He's like, well, I'm going to go all in on this episode with some gore effects and stuff. And so you're right. It's like, whoa, this is intense for Star Trek to throw this in here out of nowhere. So apparently that's why that kind of happened. Um, But otherwise, this without me having to think too hard about it is like top three and with only one episode left it there's a good chance it'll hold a top three spot very nice yeah i think they did like the espionage very well. are, are, are way up there right now yeah because i feel like this it just felt well written it felt like it was paced well it kept keeps you guessing like everybody got involved there's no wesley in this episode but i don't think he'd really fit in in this really serious episode as well as other episodes because so they didn't really need wesley but yeah i agree it was pretty up there Pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. So some Hit Trek us with facts. some of them sweet facts. I want them. So this episode is a little bit, uh, quite a bit because it's a pretty popular episode. The close-up shots of the Starfleet HQ banquet uh, were live mealworms. Those things that were the worms. The actors uh, really were eating chow mein when they put it in their mouth, though. It looks the same color from far away. And apparently it's a very popular uh worm to, to use for movies and stuff like that because you can buy them at any pet store because they're for like um, reptiles and stuff. They're really cheap and they just use them all the time. Uh, this mm. episode marks the first appearance of a Bolian, the blue-skinned race named after Star Trek veteran director Cliff Bowl, who directed this episode. He named it after himself. <laughs> That's right. And that is why it was the intro <laughs> race in today's episode. <laughs> Which Steven totally didn't do by accident. <laughs> I totally didn't. <laughs> So when Data is commenting on the orders he just read from the computer, when he's looking over all the orders over the months from Starfleet, uh, the computer interrupts him by saying, thank you, sir. I comprehend. And this is the only time in all of Star Trek when a Federation computer speaks in the first person using the word I. Um, The non-canon reference work Star Trek The Next Generation Officer's Manual explains this by stating that the Enterprise D computer was one of the most advanced ever constructed and was self-aware, but that's never used in actual canon. Um, it is also one of the few times the computer has expressed frustration with its user as more often the frustration is the other way around. And that was kind of the joke I thought was hilarious where they're always so frustrated at data for giving too much detail. And even the computer was like, all right, enough already. <laughs> I thought that was yeah, pretty fun. I get it. <laughs> um, the exterior footage of Starfleet headquarters that we see for a couple seconds, I thought it, was, it looked really good. I was like, oh, it must be from the remastered. That's because it was from Star Trek for the voyage home. They use that exact mm, footage. OK. Um, and it's also because you can see some Tellarites walking around in that little bit of footage. That's the only times Tellarites appear on Star Trek The Next Generation. And those if, are the blue guys with these. Yeah, no, that's the Andorian. So the Tellarites Andorians. are the pig like looking guys. Oh, that's right. OK, I remember that. And they're actually founding from... members of the of the Federation, but yet they're nowhere in TNG at all, which is weird. Uh, that's from what? Tower of Babel? What was that? Episode? That was one of the episodes they were in. Yeah, they were in like two yeah. or three of the original series. Um, maybe it's so like that's the one silly. with Spock's dad. That's yeah. why I remember it. 
Um, this episode won an Emmy uh, for outstanding makeup for a series. So for all that gore makeup, I guess. Wow. Uh, when Data is reviewing the Starfleet communications yet again, one of the images that flashes on the screen is a drawing of a bird with a Starfleet uniform a human and a human head and the title of the Great Bird of the Galaxy. And this is a reference to Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, who was given that nickname by one of the producers. Uh, the bird's human head is Gene's head, and the image is based on a full-color painting that was presented to Gene in 1987 for his 66th birthday. So, very random, Aww. quick little Easter egg. Uh, this was to be the introduction of the Borg initially. They would have been using the creatures to take control of the Federation, but the writer's strike made this impossible because they already had this version of the script already. So, um, thankfully, this was not the introduction of the Borg because that would have been a little weird with the creatures being used. Um, well, I was genuinely thinking about how that would have changed and i think there would have been a lot of the same elements like we still get the very insectoid vibe the central yeah. queen which is eventually revealed in star trek first being Contact, assimilated. the hive mind being assimilated there's some elements that are there but the issue is, is the borg is so overt and oppressive that this every episode would have become this episode right It'd be a whole arc. Like, well, can we trust them? Oh my God. I don't know. Maybe they've got a bug in that. Like there, it would be nonstop all the time versus Borg where it's like, if they are there, you know, they are there. Yeah. They, they don't do conspiring. They just do. We're going to take over. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just think about how different that could have been. Had this been that seed. Yeah. So thank God different. someone made the right call to walk away. And they just kind of cut this one off a little bit. Um, this episode was not banned by the BBC, like some episodes do in America if they're too violent back then, but it mm. was edited to remove the shot of Remick's head exploding. So that was changed when it was aired in the BBC initially. I don't blame them. That was not that good of an effect, really. <laughs> but also just like surprising in context. Oh, yeah. Also for taste reasons or whatever. <laughs> So the guy who played Remick, uh, a mold was made of his face filled with raw meat and then blown up to create the effect using Picard and Riker fire on him. Ooh. But both uh, the producer and one of the writers were concerned that it was too graphic. Uh, so one of Dan Curry, I guess, and the producer on the show invited his six year old son to watch the episode in order to test how children would react to it. And the, okay. the boy reportedly liked it so much that he suggested the creation of a Remick action figure whose head would blow up by pressing a button. <laughs> That so, is a good idea. That is. And this resulted in Berman deciding to just go ahead and air the episode uncut with the full sequence included because kids apparently would love it. So there you go. <laughs> but we didn't get the action figures. So that's too bad. Ah, damn. Well, well, what are our Trek connections this time around, Steve? You'd only be able to use it once, you know? Yeah, that's true. What a lame toy. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we've got Robert Schenken, who played Lin Lieutenant Commander Remick, mm -hmm. the guy from the previous episode. He was in the movie Broad Daylight. Also in this movie was one Chris Cooper, or as our fans might know him, uh, Tex Richmond from the 2011 The Muppet movie with Jason uh, Segel. He wait. played the bad guy. Ah, gotcha. So, bad guy from that. Great. Secondary one, Michael Berryman, who played Captain Ricks, who's a very distinct looking actor. Oh, yeah. I read all about he has a genetic disorder where he doesn't have hair fingernails eyelashes and like two other things right. um so he was in the movie spy hard with leslie nielsen also in spy hard was charles durning also better known to muppet fans as i'm doc hopper <laughs> charles durning fantastic and then cliff bowl who was the director named bullions did one episode of a show called shadow chasers also in this show was Avery Schreiber, who was a Muppet Show guest. Ah, uh, yes. I remember. He was the guy who was like very Jack Blackish. We'll yeah. Say. Yeah. Got that vibe. Well, that's funny. Uh, but well, it makes sense. There's so many crossovers. These are the same episode, right? I mean, really? We watched two of the really? same Really? <laughs> well, both feature people heading to dangerous territory to receive advice. Picard going down to the planet surface to learn of the conspiracy and Wembley dangering the Gorg's garden to see the trash heap for advice on his career. Oh, that's true. Uh, both have someone lying to another character to get what they want out of them. So the admirals are lying to Picard about everything being all right, just to lure him to Starfleet and to get along with Riker as well. And Gobo mm -hmm. lying to Wembley that he was mad at him just to get him to make up his mind sooner about picking a job. I had to get tough with him. He did. Yeah. Uh, both feature high pitch wailing. 
<laughs> the mother parasite at the end after the body's been blown up and Wembley when he becomes the siren. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, both have a group asking you questions in order for you to join their group. Uh, the admirals. Oh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> the admirals asking Picard questions to make sure it was really him so he could join their rebellion against the conspiracy. And the firefighters asking Wembley questions so he could join them as a firefighter. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, what's happening? I think I hear something. Oh. Transporter malfunction. <laughs> Transporter malfunction. <laughs> It was a big malfunction this was time. That, was that Mrs. Weasley? Did she <laughs> yeah. get transported from Harry Potter? It was one of those unused sound effects we had, for, had on the board. <laughs> <laughs> we lost Mrs. Weasley. She's gone. But she's here. She's here in Star Trek. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> oh, man, that was good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Trek to Rock, I'm going to bring over Admiral Quinn to replace the trash heap. Wembley going to him for advice and him asking Wembley a series of trick questions about their past, only to tell Wembley about the conspiracy deep in Fraggle Rock. <laughs> there probably is one. Uh, Trek to Rock, I'm going to have Remick come over and replace Doc. Mm -hmm. uh, but the weird, you know, that would have to be the weird mother alien version of Remick. And he keeps sending his little <laughs> bug creatures down to Fraggle Rock to attack the Fraggles. And the whole show becomes about doozers and Fraggles fighting the bug creatures. Because I totally watched yeah, that. Yeah, dude, I would watch that. I would too. Uh, Rock to Trek, I'm going to bring over the firemen and replace the parasites. And over the course of the episodes, more and more crew members start wearing funny red hats and becoming firemen uh, as they threaten to take over the ship. It becomes very obvious who's been taken over because they're wearing a fireman's yeah, outfit. They're wearing fireman's hats. <laughs> uh, Trek to Fraggle Rock. I'm oh wait, I did that one already. Fraggle Rock to Trek. I'm going to bring <laughs> the trash heap and her little minions over to become the little bug aliens, uh, because I think that would just work perfectly. Those little bug alien guys look very similar to her little minions little creepy crawlies can go in your ear so it'd be perfect they do if anything i was kind of blown away at how low quality those were yeah they were like stop motion at times it was weird i'm, I'm surprised they did stop motion that was weird yeah did they do that like can you think of another example in star trek tng where they do that not that i remember but there's bound to be at least one other occasion where there's stop motion. and they won an emmy for this episode not All for the right. stop motion probably but probably for oh, the, thank god the yeah gore. not for the special effects you said for <laughs> yeah um <laughs> well that brings us to the end of episode 127 of muppet trek podcast join us next time for fraggle rock episode the preachification of convincing john and next generation series episode the neutral zone which will be the final episode of season one how are we already through season one of TNG? We're one seventh of the way through. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that means we're going to be bringing you our top three and bottom three of the season, which by default will also be top three and bottom three of the series. So far. That's true. So far <laughs> until another 24, 26 episodes. That's right. Join us for all that and more from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. 